Hello lovelies, in this video we're going to be looking at energy transfers within an ecosystem for your A-level barge. Now there are lots of specifics that we go into here, so take it slowly and make notes as you go. Hi everyone. Okay, so we're going to start looking at how the energy that we've talked about gets made in respiration and a bit in photosynthesis and, and how that harnessing of the energy through photosynthesis, how that travels through ecosystems, how we can measure it. And then we're going to look at kind of how farming in particular and how we can kind of manipulate how much energy is available from different organisms. So just some recapping some ecosystem basics, stuff we all have done at GACSE. So an ecosystem is made up of different populations of organisms. So remember a population is a group of one species in an, in an area, in a habitat or in an ecosystem, and they interact with each other. So we know obviously that organisms are interdependent and that means they rely on each other for things like food, shelter, pollination, seed dispersal, that type of thing. So we've got the main thing we're looking at here is obviously going to be feeding relationships. So food chains like the one I've got on the right show simple lines of energy transfer between organisms. So don't forget the arrows in a food chain show the transfer of energy from one organism to another or from the sun to plants, for example. And then food webs, so a more complicated version of this with different um, animals and plants in that feed on each other and are interlinked, would show how something like different food chains would overlap with each other and interconnect. We're just going to look at food chain for now, though, to make it a little bit easier. So the sun at the start of my food chain here is the source of all energy in ecosystems. So without the sun, we wouldn't, that's the starting point for the, where the energy comes from that gets into the producers and then is transferred to all the other organisms. The energy from the sun is harnessed by producers. So the plants and things like algae and cyano, photosynthetic bacteria in the oceans, they will all absorb that light energy and through photosynthesis, as we've already talked about, produce organic molecules, which includes things like glucose, but also amino acids and lipids and other carbohydrates, etc. That, those molecules, that energy that they've harnessed and those molecules that they've built with that energy become used to build tissue. So new cells, new cell walls, new material that the plant obviously creates as it grows. That living material, those tissues, are known as biomass or the plant's biomass. So the biomasses tends to be we say all of the living material of an organism. Once that energy is stored from the sun by producers into their biomass, their living material of the plants, then the rest of this energy transfer that occurs is actually a transfer of biomass because the chemical energy that has been stored in those molecules in the bonds that make up the molecules that have made up the tissues of this organism, that is what gets passed on when an organism eats another organism, so when the rabbit eats that grass, it's ingesting the biomass, the living tissues of the plant, and it's breaking those bonds in the chemicals and the molecules down through digestion, where it's going to absorb some of those nutrients and use it to make its own molecules and biomass and living tissues. So we can, it is an, an energy transfer that's going on. We can also think of it as a transfer of biomass, because the biomass is the part that gets eaten by the organism each time in the food chain. We're going to add another part of the food chain on that we kind of didn't necessarily talk about um, or link together as much at GCSE. So remembering that as well as passing into all of these organisms when food gets, uh, when organisms eat each other, then as well some of that biomass is going to end up coming to decomposers. So some of that energy is going to end up not necessarily being passed on to the next trophic level because sometimes not all of the organisms get eaten. We're going to talk about this in the next video, but just to remind you and make sure that you're aware that obviously some of that biomass is going to also go to decomposers. They are part of the food chains as well. They are obviously, they do the breakdown, they do the decay process where they break down the molecules in dead organisms, which they use for their own nutrition. So you can, if you're not sure, remember that's called saprophytic nutrition which means they're breaking down and dissolving dead organisms so they are going to take some of that biomass as well so some of that energy some of that biomass are going to pass into decomposers so bacteria and fungi and they are also part of the food chain and also another reminder just so that before we move on we're going to hear this word a lot so this 
these labels here, primary consumer, the secondary consumer, and the producer, these are all trophic levels. Troph literally coming from the word meaning to eat. So these are all trophic levels. They're the levels that we talk about in the food chain. So if you're a primary consumer, you're often a herbivore because you're often eating plants only. Then if you're a secondary consumer, you tend to just eat animals, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then the third, they just mean first, second and third, primary, secondary, tertiary. So that's just a quick language recap that we're going to talk about in the next few videos. So biomass can be measured by weighing the dry mass of an organism. So we've said it's all of the living tissue. It's the cell walls, the cells, the bones. If you're an animal, the hair, all of it, everything that's part of the tissue is biomass. So if we dry out an organism, so we remove the water and we've got to remove the water because that's not biomass. OK, water is in living organisms because we need them to survive. But the water that's in us will vary different amounts. So if we're using weight or mass, it can't include the water because that's not something the organisms have made. That's not something this energy has been used to produce. It's not tissue, so not biomass. So we need to dry out or get rid of all the water before we take the weight. And that dry weight is therefore equivalent to the biomass of an organism. How do we do that? So the tissue needs to be dried in an oven at around 80 degrees. It needs to be high enough to evaporate the water quite quickly, otherwise it could take forever, or, um, but also not burn the sample. So there are obviously examples of dried out organisms like mummies and mummification process often involve drying but that was normally drying out over a long period of time or it was quite slow but we would need to sort of do it at a decent speed because there's going to be a lot of water in the organism around 80 degrees is about right so if you're answering questions about this then try and go for about 80 degrees or make it clear it needs to be high enough to evaporate the water but not high enough that you set the sample on fire or you burn it or damage it in any way the sample is then regularly weighed until you get constant mass. So the mass no longer changes. This is going to confirm to you that all the water is evaporated because if you weigh it and it goes back into the drying oven and you get it out and it's lost a bit more mass, you've lost a bit more water. But until you get to a point where you can take it out of the oven a few times and it doesn't change, the mass doesn't change, that means that you've probably evaporated all the water. So that's biomass, but what about energy? Well, we can use something called a calorimeter which is going to be able to help us to measure the actual chemical energy that's in that biomass it's called a calorimeter and careful how we spell it because some um, exam boards are going to be very mindful that if you incorrectly spell this you might they might think you're spelling colorimeter so the machine that measures sort of color the the transparency or absorbance of light moving through substances so what we use to measure kind of the colors of solutions or how cloudy a solution is that's a colorimeter as in color this is a calorimeter with an a because it measures calories try and think about the fact that it measures calories um, because it's measuring energy so just be careful and mindful around spelling there it's an a so we take a known mass of dried tissue. So we've, we've dried our biomass, we've measured it. So we've got our, our biomass reading and we know how much we take a small amount of that or a sample of a known mass. And we're going to seal it into a container and we're going to burn it. So we're going to set it on fire. So that's why there needs to be a little bit of oxygen in this. It is sealed, but there is enough oxygen for it to burn. And we set it on fire, contained it. So we don't set it on fire and then put it into the container. We set it on fire in there when it's already sealed. So that's why we have these little fuse wires that go to a heat element that will heat up and spark, causing it to set on fire. And then so then you've got this metal kind of casing where your sample is, and that's surrounded by a known volume of water. And the known volume of water, you've got a thermometer that's in there that's measuring the temperature of the water and you've got a stirrer. The stirrer is important. And sometimes they've I've seen questions on this. So this here, the stirrer is important because it's constantly moving that water around. So you'll notice the stirrer is far away from the thermometer. But if you didn't constantly move around that water, then the convection currents of the heat would sort of be moving around in the water. So we wouldn't get an even temperature everywhere. And that thermometer reading might not be as accurate. So what we need to make sure we do is we stir that water continuously. So the heat is generated evenly in the water around it. So that reading on the thermometer is accurate. So then the energy that's given off 
from the heat from burning our biomass is then used or obviously will then go on to heat the water and that temperature change of the water from before we heated the substance to once the substance has been burned that transfer of heat energy and how much energy is transferred we can tell by how much the temperature of water goes up then we can work out and you'll you'll know this from things like specific heat capacity from physics at GCSE we can work out how much energy therefore was transferred which tells you how much energy was in the sample and so then we can get a reading of like our biomass instead of just being biomass in grams, we can now say we know the energy that's in that biomass in joules or kilojoules. So once you've measured a biomass, you're, what are the units gonna be? So we're not gonna just normally measure one plant or one or two plants if we're doing this, or one or two animals. Um, we would normally be looking at measuring a large number, sort of the, the trophic level or the entire population of a certain organism in order to get an idea of how energy is moving through a food chain. So typical measurements are going to be kilograms for biomass will be kilograms per meter squared. So we're going to be doing some sampling. We'll talk about that in a second. So you're taking it per an area of the habitat. Or if you're talking about somewhere really big or really big fields, really big large areas of land, then you could go up to kilograms per hectare squared. If the biomass of, is of a harvest, like a set amount of plants or um, organisms that were grown in a specific time, so say a year, so in the time that they've been planted, then it can be recorded as kilograms per metre squared per year. So that's how um, much biomass is being produced in a set area in a set time, in this case, a year. So if you're looking for a farmer, it's looking for its, how much um, biomass its plants are producing, how much yield is he getting from a certain size field in a certain year that's how we could work this out now the farmer isn't going to destroy his whole crop in order to kind of figure this out how well his plants have grown so we need to do some sampling so if you're going to sample plants you wouldn't dig up the whole field and dry them all and measure the biomass of every single one but you'd carry out a random sample using um, a technique we've talked about that you've known from GCC from sampling using something like a quadrat you'd sample a few meters squared where you'd dig up some plants so you'd sacrifice a small uh, amount of the product because obviously with farmers, etc., they're going to want to sell it um, for profit. So you can't take too much. But you'd measure a small sample, measure the biomass, just as we talked about, or measure the energy from the biomass. Then you can do both and calculate that by timesing and multiplying that up to the whole area of the field. And the same if you're going to sample animals. So a random sample of animals can be caught that, you know, live in a specific area. You would count or sample to multiply to figure out the number of the population that's in that area and then once you've worked out the biomass or energy from the sample you can multiply that up by the population that's in that habitat in that ecosystem obviously catching killing and burning animals in order to find out their biomass is obviously got some ethical implications attached to it so that wouldn't happen um, regularly unless it was really important that you need to find out um, the biomass or the energy. So most scientists will use estimates of energy or biomass from animals that have been done with previous work or that have been worked out in a slightly different way so that they can use an estimate of how much biomass would there would be in a certain size or age of animal or maybe how much energy a certain size animal would provide in the food chain. OK, so once you've worked out the biomass um, of your population or the energy that's in the biomass for your population then often we tend to use like a, an image a graph a diagram that we often call a pyramid to kind of demonstrate the different trophic levels so the biomass or the energy in each of the trophic levels remembering trophic level is just like producer consumer primary consumer secondary consumer that kind of those categories so we can draw pyramids of biomass which is obviously grams or kilograms per meter squared or per hectare squared, depending on how big we're talking about, they're more reliable than if we just did pyramids of numbers, which would just be the number of plants or the number of insects or the number of frogs, because they are a little bit more kind of taking into account the actual biomass, which is obviously what the energy is when we're talking about energy flow through the ecosystems. But they can only be estimated with a small sample. So instead of being able to use quadrats or catch large samples of insects, because you'd obviously use mark and recapture or you would just count them you can count more or count a larger sample in order to calculate biomass as we've said you'd have to kill the organism so you're not going to be able to take a large sample you're only going to be taking a small sample 
which may, may not be as representative of the whole population. So the problems with these are obviously drying and weighing of organisms, especially animals, is time consuming and catching and killing animals in order to dry them comes with ethical issues. And obviously animals can also contain waste inside them, inside their digestive systems that would be included in that biomass unless you removed it. And then removing it is obviously another issue. So it just becomes a, an issue in order to try and do this properly. Often that's when we end up using estimates but it is still better or more accurate than just cow organisms. We could also use the energy calculations from the biomass to make pyramids of energy. So these would be in kilojoules or joules per meter squared per year, potentially. You don't always have to have per year, but it can be. These would be the most accurate because two organisms with the same biomass could store different amounts of energy. So um, hopefully we've learnt at some point that energy is actually different depending on the biological molecule. So one gram of fat stores twice the amount of energy of one gram of carbohydrates. So one gram of carbohydrates or some form of sugar is going to be less energy rich than a fat store. So different organisms at different stages of their lives, at different times of the year, are going to contain different amounts of fat and different amounts of carbohydrates as part of their biomass. And so the actual measuring of the energy of the biomass takes this into account. If you just were looking at biomass, that's really just realistically the weight or the size or the amount of mass that's created in the, in the plants and animals. So the problems with this kind of method of using it is that although it is the most accurate, it still relies on biomass to be taken. So it has the same problem as pyramids of biomass with being able to catch and dry and the ethical issues involved, as well as being representation of a small sample. But also it's only a representation of that one point in time. And as we said, energy from a single time point can be affected by the season, the weather. So if it's really cold, um, animals are going to have more fat stores. They might have winter coats or more fur, which is obviously going to be an, an increased uh, biomass reading, which then obviously more fat as well will be a higher increase in energy reading. So it is a snapshot. It's a, not only is it a small representation that we've scaled up, but it will also be a snapshot potentially in time, which could vary every single time that you take a sample if you take it through different periods of time in the year. So that is a quick snapshot of how energy um, flows through ecosystems and also how we can measure it, how we measure biomass, how we use a calorimeter, and then how we can display that as pyramids of biomass or of energy. We're going to look in the next video about the measurements that we've taken or we could be taking here and using that to measure the efficiency of energy transfer through these food chains. Ouch! This is why in some videos I have unexplained scratches.